Hi everybody, thanks for joining us. I'm Jeff Wilson, President of Novametrics Research. This presentation is to prepare you for our upcoming session on the collaborative economy and how you can leverage to drive the outcomes that are of most importance to you. Now before we get started, please make sure you've watched the YouTube video shown here. It's called Community Network Integration. It's on YouTube. It'll give you all the information you need to understand what we're going to be talking about. It's the same information that we've provided to your customers, key opinion leaders, other people in your company, and so on, to engage them in a whole range of collaborative economy projects. Just to be clear, we totally get that you're very busy, you have budget demands, maybe even budget cuts, you have time demands, staffing pressures, and maybe a whole range of issues related to stress and work-life balance. So we totally get and appreciate that. So very rightly, you might be asking, why are we doing this? And the answer is that what we're going to be talking about is going to make your life a whole lot easier. So if you're feeling stressed, please bear with us, relax, take a deep breath. We'll take you through this. So here's what we're going to be doing in this video and in this upcoming session and why it's going to be a lot more helpful to you than you can probably appreciate right now. We honestly have your back. In very practical terms, we're going to be first telling you very briefly what the collaborative economy is, why it's coming down the track and how it will help you. Then we're going to tell you about a whole bunch of things that your clients, your key opinion leaders, your regulatory partners, uh, people in your company and so on are assembling to do to be of huge help to you. And we're gonna set you up so that when we meet, you can decide how to align up all of what's most pressing to you. So the things on your plate right now that are your highest priority, how to align those um, with all this stuff that's emerging to make you more successful, short, medium, and long-term. Okay, so to get very practical, let's start first with your customers. Your customers are feeling squeezed for time, money, staff, exactly the way you are. They're also feeling as though they're suppliers, like yourselves and your competitors and a whole other range of suppliers they have in their, in their work lives or in their personal lives, say they care, but they believe, customers believe, that those suppliers really care mainly about their own bottom line. So fundamentally, there's a profound failure of trust in society right now. It's nothing specific about you or nothing specific about the animal health industry. It's the world in general. They also hear their suppliers say that they're committed to adding value, but people have been around the block and they're wondering, is that actually true? Again, don't worry, it's not personal about you. Your customers, customers feel the same way about them. It's pervasive. It's also really important just to recognize the obvious, and that is that your customer has essentially infinite suppliers, and those suppliers are all telling your customers that they're going to make them more profitable, they're going to make their pets more healthy, their lives better, and so on and so forth. But you can appreciate that they have no way of knowing which ones are actually true, which ones, which solutions actually will work for them, just like for you with your own suppliers, like your bank and your internet provider and almost anything else, they have no way of knowing that. And they're starting to ask questions because customers, and that's just us, we're all starting to ask questions and we're starting to wake up. And they're asking things like, could solutions from different suppliers work better together in combination than alone? And if so, which ones? And if you're a customer, that's actually a really good question to be asking. Now, naturally, suppliers generally try to avoid that question, even though it could be a huge value add to their customers. Now, let's talk about you for a minute. From your perspective, of course, you want to add more value to customers, but you can't do it at any cost or you'd go bankrupt. So the question becomes, how do you add high value inexpensively? There's basically one good answer, and that is authentically in the first case, so that is honestly and openly with the best interest of the customer actually in mind. And secondly, it's almost, through provi almost always through providing integrated information that takes the form of things like data and data analytics, effectively 
done, expertise and advice, often it's relationships of trust and value from you or your network. So now we start to get to the really interesting part. How do you provide high value information like that? Because it's not in your core business to do things like do data analytics for your customers. And your competitors are looking at the same things and trying to do the same things. And of course, anything that gets started by somebody gets copied almost immediately. The answer, as you'll see, is through effective collaboration with others in the network by taking a leadership role in organizing the network to provide high value to you and your customers, provide value to your customers at little or no cost to you, or even better, by getting paid for it. Now, if you thought you would have a choice in all of this, there's another group you should be aware of. They're called the disruptors. Their companies, we're all aware of them like the ones shown here. Uber, Amazon, Airbnb, and there's getting to be tons of them. Some are social enterprises like Wikipedia. They almost always use a collaborative business model using high value information and relationships across networks to radically disrupt entire industries. It used to be that technology was the prime disruptor, but that's no longer the case. Believe it or not, technology is becoming too easy to create. The prime disruptor now is social innovation. Things like trust and empathy, creating community, creating innovation platforms. And unlike Uber, these new disruptive community network business models are highly collaborative. This is part of the good news. They welcome you. They want you to be part of this and to benefit from it authentically. That disruption is about to hit the animal health industry in Canada and globally. It turns out that we're all going to be playing a role collaboratively in this disruption. For our part, we've been co-leading some national collaborative projects to allow animal health to enter the collaborative economy seamlessly, but in a timely manner, because this is coming down the track towards all of us. There are two in progress in Canada right now the National Beef Cattle Network Project, and a similar one for companion animals, including equine. On deck are poultry, swine, aquaculture, health and public health, non-animal food products, and a range of others. And there are a lot more emerging globally and in Canada, like we mentioned in the other video. We're going to be telling you first about the National Beef Cattle Network Project. We'll be going over companion animals after but everything about beef applies directly to companion animals and every other species. So please pay attention to this beef part, even if you're not working in the beef industry right now. If you're wondering anything like, how does this work? Why is it different from other beef cattle networks that already exist and so on? You'll have to watch the other video. It's explained in the other video. Okay, so here is how the next level of the collaborative economy is going to be entering the beef sector in Canada. Some of you may know Dr. Eugene Jansen at the University of Calgary. He's a professor of beef cattle clinical medicine there. Dr. Jansen is an example of an influencer, a key opinion leader, if you will, who gets the collaborative economy. Like we described in the first video, he sees that there's no actual coherent leadership of the beef cattle network in Canada as a whole. There's parts of it that are collaboratively led, but the whole is not integrated. And as a result, there's no collaborative enterprise to um, uh, collaboratively and effectively improve health or profitability or AMR or, or virtually anything else within the beef cattle network. Again, if that doesn't make sense to you, look at the other video. Now, like a lot of people, we've been talking to him for about three years now. He's running a national meeting to, get, to bring together key network partners from the beef network across Canada. So this is government, value chains, academics, and so on, your customers and your key opinion leaders. The first pilot project he wants to, to run is this one. Map the beef cattle network across Canada so we actually know for the first time who's in it 
who's doing what, where the resources lie, and for the first time we can begin identifying duplication, inefficiencies, and so on, and eliminating them. And that's just the start. Then he wants to begin a series of integrated projects to drive benefits to all players. This is key, like in the first video, around things like AMR, that's antimicrobial resistance, for anybody who's not aware of that, uh, health and productivity um, and, and economics in the beef industry and animal welfare around and a, and a series of other issues as well. We're helping him because he realizes that he understands beef cattle and we understand the collaborative economy and we have a repeatable process for bringing different sectors into the collaborative economy called community network integration or CNI, again described in the other video. With his help and the help of a bunch of other people, we've already connected to a, quite a large number of people in the beef cattle network, early adopters, like the ones shown here. Many, of course, are in Western Canada, but they're across Canada. And we're doing the same thing in the US and globally now. They're all nicely aligning around what Dr. Jansen is doing and they want to help. As I say, like in the first video, these are early adopter collaborators. They're the innovators, maybe, in, in sales terminology. So they're good people to work with. They're highly collaborative. They want to work with you folks and with each other. Incidentally, they're also among your best customers and key opinion leaders. Here's where we're at. The initial engagement of major key players in the Beef Network is already complete. We're now finalizing a leadership team. It'll be around 10 people or so representing the beef network across Canada. On there will be many of your customers and key opinion leaders. That leadership team will act as a steering committee for a network meeting of about 50 to 100 people planned for this fall. Daniel Beauchamp is on that leadership team. He's also on a Canada-US leadership team for solutions in AMR. It has people like the head of CPARS, the, the Canadian antimicrobial resistance surveillance uh, unit within the federal government, it has people like the head of the board of the National Institute for Animal Agriculture, the main networking board for animal or networking group for animal uh, agriculture in the United States, it has senior global pharma, um, other suppliers and so on. The Canada Beef Meeting was just one project that came out of that Canada US team. There are a whole bunch of other ones now emerging in Canada and globally. On the leadership team, you get to authentically and transparently with others help design the process to your benefit and to your customer's benefit. One of the things that people want to do is create this living map of the beef network. So for the first time, we actually know who's in it and where the resources lie that can help you and your customers. So customers are very interested in connecting to other people like them. They're interested in a community innovation platform, especially one connected to other parts of the network. Obviously, this list of people and connectivity, at the very least, is a sales opportunity for you. It'll provide expert advice to suppliers and to yourselves that you're currently not able to access or aren't even aware of. Funding opportunities, we'll talk about that in a moment, and resources in kind. Next, it's going to allow us to identify duplication of effort and spending under leveraged resources, wasted resources, and so on that can be redirected to the benefit of people in the network like you and your customers. So, for example, people are now naturally asking things like, where is association money actually being spent? Do the associations have the resources, the expertise, and so on to do the kinds of things they're doing independently, or should they be part of a broader network that brings in more co-funding and more expertise? Same thing with government programs. Your own sponsorship of, of uh, customers and industry, is it being effectively co-leveraged against other resources in the network? And what about graduate students? Are they being effectively leveraged for actual industry solutions? Or is some of what they're doing be di being directed towards curiosity-driven research as opposed to actual solutions within the network? So some more, and again, some of this overlaps, so there may be a little re repetition, but by working with this and guiding it, being on the leadership team, you'll be able to find 
for yourselves and for the network substantial co-funding opportunities and free resources that are that are floating around in the network being radically underutilized so funding from the associations government funding and and when we meet we can go over this in detail there's major opportunities here uh, co-funding with other suppliers non-traditional funding sources so once you start extending the network you start to see oh there are a whole bunch of people we normally don't bring into this who are very interested in co-funding this Consumer businesses, the food business, the banking business, uh, major endowment funds that are interested in social innovation and so on. Why do they do these things? Well, it's in the other video, but high level. They do it because they too get re better return when they invest collaboratively with other people that bring in other expertise, other money, on the ground, know-how and so on to create better solutions. It works for everybody. Here's another one. Instead of all sorts of different people, government, academia, industry, um, all working on multiple relatively disconnected projects in isolation, we align the key opinion leaders through this process for co-funded action research to support actual solutions, not simply surveillance, not simply coming together to talk, but actually to create practical solutions around things like health, performance, AMR, animal welfare. Naturally, your products, people are going to be wanting to look at your products transparently within the network with all your key opinion leaders around say, saying, how could your vaccines, how could your antibiotics, how could these all be part of the solution? As long as it's done authentically and transparently, it doesn't mean you have to, it's not about revealing confidential information, it's about being transparent about your intent. As long as that happens, your products will be positioned very nicely and authentically within the marketplace in a way that you can't possibly do it on your own because of this trust issue. Already talked about it, bring in graduate students and faculty to actually align with the actual required solutions, which happens sometimes, but not nearly as much as it can. If you're in regulatory, regulators want to be part of this. They want to be part of the network so they can sit down in a circle of trust with pharma, with animal welfare, with um, uh, producers to create coherent policy solutions that actually work because they're tired of being the bad guy always getting beaten up for unintended consequences of their policies. Instead of endless meetings, like endless AMR meetings, where we bring people together to just share information, we bring them together to actually co-create value-added solutions, and then we test the solutions in the marketplace. Obviously, this gives you a very good opportunity to meet with customers and key opinion leaders often much more easily than what you have now because you're not selling anything in the first instance you're you're in a position of leading but of course you get to to then be at the table bring your products and solutions together and other people will sell your solutions for you again it has to be totally authentic and transparent and now for you personally to come back to where we were at the beginning of this presentation where we were talking about you not having enough time money people and so on all of this is going to identify people in the network who want to do things that you're already doing. They want to share some of your workload. That's gonna create more time for you, more time to reflect, more time to think or to work smarter, not harder. It's going to create funding opportunities like we talked about from the network, which is going to provide resources to you and free up more time for you. And as we talked about, it's gonna be a a straightforward way to create low cost, high value solutions for you and your customers. And with that, better sales. Now, if we turn up for a moment to companion animals, the process is exactly the same. It's just the details that differ. So obviously they're different species. Some of the networks are different, but some of them are the same because they overlap. The focus is on pet wellness, quality of life, value to the pet owner for dollars spent, of course, as opposed to in the beef cattle, profitability, AMR, and so on. Otherwise, the fundamental process is the same. 
So we're now similarly aligning national leadership teams in the companion animal area. Daniel Beauchamp is on that national leadership team. Okay, now if you can bear with me a bit, I'm going to go a little bit big picture and a little bit looking out. Not a decade, a few years, but just so you can see where this is all going. And why it's important to be part of this now and not a year from now. The next mega wave in retailing is consumer one-stop shopping, like in this diagram here. Instead of consumers buying from a whole bunch of different vendors for whatever they get, everything from groceries to pet products to what, what have you, there's a community platform where many products can be purchased more easily. Buying groups like vet purchasing and all that sort of thing are obviously an early example of that. But this is going way beyond that because it's the network that emerges and you can see how this is going to come out of what's happening right now. It's going to include not just vets and vendors and the buying group. It's going to include animal owners, vets, suppliers, regulator, regulators, the media. NGOs like the associations, the veterinary associations, the commodity groups, and so on, the advocacy groups, they're all going to be on a community platform, or it might be an integrated suite of platforms collaborating together to drive value for everyone. And it will all be done collaboratively. In the business world, people are now saying the days of Amazon are already numbered unless they can transition to this collaborative model, which is frankly pretty unlikely. The process in Canada is already happening. The IT framework is already being developed, including the artificial intelligence backbone, which will end up running a lot of it. And investors are lining up. So it's very real. Now, during our session, you're going to be working together in groups to brainstorm how to align your top priorities, your bread and butter, the things that are of most importance to you with these collaborative economy animal health pilots. The examples we've given here, especially the beef cattle one where we've gone in a fair amount of detail, those are going to be very useful in that brainstorming process for you. We'll help you, but we need you to be thinking in terms of how now to apply those examples to your situation. Here's another one that's low hanging fruit for you. Your global corporate business and your regional affiliates are simply part of your network. Once you get onto this network thing, you start to see the world very differently. They're particularly low hanging fruit for you in terms of advancing your interest because your interests are very closely aligned with theirs. And you already have excellent relationships already in place with many of them and you can expand that easily. So as a mind exercise and kind of as preparation for when we meet, here's a question. How do you engage the global business to your benefit and theirs? To get that started, it's exactly the same process. It's always the same process. In this case, treat your global business as your best customer. Add massive value to them by showing them how to engage in the collaborative economy. You then become a regional pilot project for global, which will draw in global resources because it adds massive, highly leverageable and expandable value to the global business. Here's a quick overview of the agenda for when we meet. So this is going to be action oriented. It's not going to be much of me talking. It's going to be you guys brainstorming and then coming back, reporting on what your thoughts are, and then we'll collect it together in, in a coherent plan. So we'll have a very quick review of the objectives, very quick introductions or sort of summary uh, of, who, of who's who, so we know who's on the line. Then we're gonna move you into, into small groups. So that's why it's so important to, to have seen these videos. We're gonna run a little thing called Think, Pair, Share. So small groups, Quickly clarify your top sales, regulatory, and other strategic objectives. Stuff that's totally bread and butter for you. Brainstorm how to integrate those, how to align them to your benefit with the beef and companion animal leadership teams and the meetings that are rolling out. 
Same thing with, as I say, with the national meetings. So align with the leadership teams and then align uh, with the inevitable large meetings that are going to happen. Think through who should be there, what the primary objective should be, what should be the main outcomes, maybe a bit about how to actually achieve that. As we're doing this, we're going to be thinking very practically in terms of you personally, each of you, how do we align your objectives so that we create for you more time, more, more funding, more resources in kind, and, and people support for you? And then we're going to be talking about, or we'll be summarizing all this in terms of specific next steps to drive this forward so you're fully prepared for what's coming down the pipeline and can fully take advantage of it. So that's it. Thanks so much, everybody, for your time. It truly is a pleasure to be working with you. And we'll really be looking forward to meeting with you soon to make this come alive for you. Thanks very much.